Awesome. Dan, are we live here? Looks I like it. So. All right. Well, I was just going to kick it off and with a big greetings to all of the GRES members and ESG colleagues from the United States and Brazil and Mexico and Canada and actually from all around the globe. And so thank you for everybody for joining us in this ESG deep dive, data deep dive, which is a special event that we're having right now uh, with our fr good friends at Measurable. So Neil, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing great. It's nice to see you. Uh, I'm sure many of you know that I used to work at GRES. So Dan and I were teammates for many years. We used to love doing these revol results event uh, shows live. It's so weird to be doing them here. And I hope maybe next year we'll get to queue it up live show again. Excellent. Yeah. And so you've brought colleagues. I've brought colleagues. All right. I've got my colleague, Max uh, Maywald, who's with us from Amsterdam. He's going to be kicking off and, and well, he'll be talking about some uh, of the real data deep dive issues. He's been doing a lot of anal analytics, excuse me, analysis with our data. Um, and Neil, you brought some friends too, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've got uh, Aaron from our data science team here at Measurable. And uh, I've also got two people from Bridge, who's one of our best customers, who's a recent uh Grez participant, so Ilya and Izella from Bridge, and we'll do some intros to them at some point. But yeah, I think it's gonna be great. We have some perspective of some data side. We got Max on from the real estate side. We've got an actual customer and uh, someone who's actually had to go and do this crazy uh, participation thing. So uh, sounds fun. Perfect. Well, you know, I was thinking as I was coming into this with COP26 happening, you know, what's the topic on everyone's mind? Well, it's net zero. And, you know, that's how do we get there? Is it possible? And I'm here to say, yes, it is. We have a number of participants that actually have uh, delivered net zero portfolios this year. And that's scope one and two, right? Scope one and two net zero, Kilroy, Hudson Pacific, a number of private equity funds, MetLife, they've been doing a great job, right? And then can we accurately measure progress? So Max has been digging into our data. He's going to be able to talk about those issues, targets, COP26 alignment, assurance and data quality. But before we do that, there's three points and a little housekeeping. So the first one is Grez released our results on October 1st. And can you believe it, Neil? Canada was number one again. Again, number one again up in Canada, right? No surprise. It's really our side, right? that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that is number one in North America on the Grez assessment, right? But there's leadership like Ivanhoe Cambridge, $8.4 billion tied to ESG KPIs, including their Grez score. I mean, that's pretty amazing, tough to beat, but it's not without controversy because Brazil is coming up on the rear. They're close behind, right? They only submitted eight funds this year, but tomorrow's our Latin American event. And I'm, I'm feeling just tremendous momentum. And I will tell you, Neil, it was a number of the people that you were talking to a couple of years ago uh, that have joined us as country partners. So thanks to you for all your effort there. And I'm seeing some big things happening from Latin America next year. Um, yeah. and the third thing is we have this five-year roadmap. And it's really starting to take shape. We announced this over the summer. The GRES member survey results are being collated now. So look for, by the end of the year, some feedback that informs you know, our forward vision um, and then you know, other ways that working groups will start to percolate and, and our members can participate in what this looks like in the phase two. I also wanted to give a big thanks. Big thanks because ESG is a team effort and it takes all of us pushing together to make positive progress. Sasha, Anna, and Alex on the Grez team, thank you so much. They deserve a lot of special recognition. They've been, I, I think this is event number 12, perhaps 13 of a total calendar of 17 that takes special dedication without a doubt. And then Neil, on your side, yourself and Kelia, right? Couldn't do it without you. Thanks a million for making it all work. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point. And yeah, our uh, communications and marketing team is being super helpful on this. And um, we're glad to not just do the, you know, the standard results event this year. And we're super pumped about getting a little data, you know, data deep dive, as we said. Uh, it's been really fun for our data science team to work with your team and to try to actually look at some numbers and see if there's some real insights that uh, I think it's going to be interesting to the industry and for uh, people to watch today. So great. Awesome. I mentioned some housekeeping. So just before we get started, public results are posted on our brand new website. So please dig in and check it out. Look underneath the sub tab under insights for the public results. We're getting some good compliments from our, our global membership base on this website. So uh, hopefully it's working for everybody. The webinar is being recorded and it will be posted online to all of the regist registrants. Um, and so that URL will be coming along. 
And please look you know, for Q&A. Please look at the bottom of the screen and post any questions that you have. Neil and I will try to follow along and, and keep tabs of the questions as they come in. And so as a final note, everybody knows refreshments in back and bathroom around to the right. Cool. With that, let's get started and let's uh, take a look. Uh, yeah, Neil, that's good. Let's take a look at the results. <laughs> <laughs> let's take a look at the results. Let's go to the next slide, Alex. Aha, here's our great panelists, right? So we talked about the Bridge Investment Group. So the two people on, on the top with Neil and then Max is down on the right. Uh, he's hanging out on the screen with us and the measurable uh, folks from, with Aaron and, and Neil, uh, happy to be have all of us here. Let's keep moving. 12 year journey, 117,000 assets uh, came in on the GRESB assessment this year. Let's go take a look at how we got here over 12 years. So in 2009, GRESB was started as the original ESG due diligence questionnaire. A couple of institutional investors got together and they say, hey, what is everybody, all of our fund managers, what are they doing when it comes to sustainability efforts? And that idea took root and it took hold. In 20, and the membership grew and grew. And then in 2017, a number of folks stepped forward and said, you know, you've been very successful in real estate. How about if we create an infrastructure assessment? A lot of leadership came from Canada, AIMCO, OTTP, got together with APG, PGGM, and six others. And they pushed and they created an infrastructure fund and asset level assessment. And then the investors really started to join. So right now we are, we're closing in on 150 institutional investor members. They control a lot of assets and a lot of uh, uh, capital under management. Let's go to the next slide. We can see some of those uh, logos there. Uh, not all of them are there, but you know it's a pretty impressive group and uh, we're continuing to add more. I've got a couple in my back pocket that I hope will uh, arrive by the end of the year as a Christmas gift. Let's go to the next slide. Benchmark participation is also up. The first year, 200 participants, that really set the stage. And it's been slow and steady growth for the last decade where leaders stepped forward and we really started to percolate in the industry. But what I really like about this graphic are the last two years. The slope of the line changed and it's up 25% year on year on year. And so what we're seeing is roughly half, if you count by, what I, you know, by, by funds, by entities, roughly half comes from the EU. And then uh, 360 esque from the Americas, let's go to the next slide, we can see a breakdown of what that means. So 784 from the EU, but if you add the totals of the US dollar denomination underneath, and also honestly the asset amounts, if you add Europe and Asia together, you barely reach North America. I don't even think, I think you're still a little shy. And so we have an outsized influence in the benchmark, in making progress as an industry. And I think it's really important to know we've got 366, but they're really big funds and they're really big direct accounts from Canada that are coming in and really driving progress. 117,000 assets, 1520 was the count this year. And I'm thinking that uh, based upon our email and inbound momentum, and we can talk about that with the measurable team as well, I think that number is gonna grow, hopefully maybe another 25% for next year. Go ahead, let's move to the next slide. In the Americas, here's what this looks like, the breakdown, 300 roughly from North America, 41 from Canada, seven and eight respectively from Brazil and, and Mexico. And so we'll see on the next slide, Alex, there we go. There, these are the, the average scores globally uh, from uh, over time. So you'll see 2010, 11, 12, nice up to the right. In 2013, we made some changes to the assessment. Scores dropped. We moved down. It was a bit of a reset. And then a nice run all the way until, guess what? We did it again last year. And we broke up management and performance much more clearly so we can set the stage going forward to redefine what performance means. We're seeing these net zero portfolios come into GRESB and our system right now doesn't necessarily reward those the way that they probably should be. And so we've kicked off this major engagement process with Sydney, Australia and the UK and the EU and Toronto and North America and all points in between to talk about what performance is what it means and how this can be better reflected in the GRESB assessment going forward. So a lot to look forward to. The, this little chart here on the bottom right, it shows the differences or the breakpoints between one and five stars. And you'll see that the benchmark continues to move. So three points, if you didn't jump three points in from year on year, then you might've dropped from a star ranking system. It is a force rank system. 20% of all participants receive a five star and 20% receive a one star. One star is actually a great score. 
One star means that you are in the benchmark, you've started the journey, as many like to call it, and you're on your way. There's a whole lot of portfolios out there that are no stars. So keep up the good work, everybody. Know that the benchmark will continue to progress over time. We are concerned about the uh, sort of clustering on the upper right of this quadrant and, and chart. And so look for additional changes, especially when performance in this five-year roadmap uh, comes to fruition. Uh, there will be some changes in scoring at that time. So let's go to the next slide because I think we're getting ready for my colleague, Mac, uh, Max. But before we do that, we've got some quotes because COVID was you know, a big impact on the benchmark. So here's some comments from people that came in, uh, in in their assessments, right? So people spending more time at home. So there's positive you know, sort of impacts from a, a, a energy spend and consumption on the residential side where some of those numbers started to either hold steady or even climb. And then on the industrial side, right? Business continuity was an issue. Having uh, more industrial activity was certainly happening, particularly with Amazon and deliveries at home that we're all experiencing. Um, diversified portfolio is kind of a mixed bag. So no surprises here, but obviously COVID is a big impact on what everybody's seeing. Okay, so Alex, move forward because now it's time to introduce Max towards a net zero industry. So Max, you've been digging into our data, looking at you know, what's happening out there with EUIs and target setting and data assurance. Let's turn it over to you. Tell us what we're seeing. Thanks a lot, Dan. Uh, welcome also from, from to everybody. Um, can you please go to the next slide already, uh, Alex? Thanks a lot. And what we can see here now is really the comparison of intensities in Europe and America. So one thing that I would like to note here is, as everybody know, we are in assessment uh, that is yearly, meaning in the 2021 assessment, we actually look at the 2020 data and the 2020 assessment, the 2019 data. This is really important right now to note when, you, when we compare these figures to the latest stage of uh, today's program, when actually the measurable is even more talking about the more current data that, that, they, that they actually retrieved from the United States market. So what you can see here is across the board in Europe and Americas, a slight de decrease in intensities, which we all actually kind of, of course, uh, anticipated due to COVID. But since we look at 2020 data, not the entire impact of COVID is yet in, in this data points. However, as Dan also mentioned is when you look at, at industrials, that in Americas, we only had a very, very slight decrease, but we actually had an increase in intensities in Europe. So this really shows that e-commerce that we all most likely utilize even more than ever before, like uh, Amazon, like the Bohe in Netherlands, which is like all the local Amazon, uh, so really drove the higher consumption values actually in the industrial assets. So this is really where this can show different impacts in different sectors. Well, of course, the hotel business, as we all know, basically shut down for the entire uh, 2020 year, meaning we actually had definitely way lower intensities in, in this sector uh, to see. Later, actually, on this stage, even more for measurable size. Yeah, actually, Max, can I jump in on that? Because I think this yeah, is a great please. slide to uh, tie into the discussion that's going to happen throughout today. So when Aaron comes on later, he's going to talk more about uh, energy impacts due to COVID in uh, different asset types across. And we're going to focus more on uh, the Americas and on U.S. Um, I think this is really fascinating to start seeing how there is some slight differences between Europe and Americas. I thought the healthcare one was interesting because I would have assumed in both regions that healthcare would have gone up. Um, but I think we were talking about this earlier and you said this is not necessarily hospitals. Uh, this is more uh, care facilities and other healthcare related stuff. So strange to see that it's gone down in Europe. Yeah, absolutely. I actually just saw in the chat that James Lee, also the, the uh, partner of ours, uh, just uh, asked a question of how we actually calculate these intensities. So one thing uh, is really, we only calculate intensities at the moment for assets with 100% data coverage. So only assets where we actually have full data for the entire year and full floor area are actually considered for intensity calculations. At some later stages, we might go over to actually estimating these gaps as well for our participants. So we then can have an overall pic even better picture of intensities across the benchmark. So right now it's really assets with 100% data coverage are only part of these calculations. And the second part of the question was, uh, how we normalize the, the data points. So re here really is, um, we do use the occupancy or uh, inverted actually the vacancy rate as well 
and normalize the consumption values by this occupancy and vac or vacancy rate. So in case you, for example, have a certain consumption value and occupancy of only 80%, we normalize your consumption values to actually an overall higher overall consumption to account for these missing 20% and then uh, calculate the intensities based on these normalized values for you. So these are really uh, normalized for uh, occupancy as well. Yeah, and, and that's a great answer, Max. And I, I think just so people know in the audience, the intention for today is to not just have us kind of uh, go through and show you a whole bunch of numbers and then uh, log off. Uh, we love getting questions on uh, in the chat. So please throw them in there and we'll try to answer as we go. Uh, there's another one in there about residential decreasing. Uh, Max, any ideas on that? Because it also seems like a strange thing in Europe with everybody working from home. Ideas on uh, why that might have happened? Uh, that's a really good, a good question. I mean, the decrease isn't that big, as you can see. Um, it was went only from 125 to 118 uh, kilowatt hours per square meter. So maybe mm -hmm. this is really uh, just overall um, more uh, or more efficient grids, more efficient usage of um, energy within the residential units. But yeah, this is really one thing that we really can't completely explain just look, looking at the data. So it's really can be, go either way, as, as we said before. Yeah, and also we have to remember, as someone, as I think Dan's noted on here, is that in different asset types on here, data coverage and um, how you're collecting it is also challenging. So some places where you're in a different uh, leasing structure, you're not collecting the actual consumption data from the tenant and is a tenant data and things like that too. So these are really big picture numbers on intensities, uh, but we'll uh, we'll dive more into this uh, later and in detail also. So, uh, yeah, great. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Yeah, Alex, next slide, please. Yeah, here, just like really quick, don't want to talk about much about this because we all more or less kind of expected this. These are now the global like to like changes, actually. Uh, so we can see across the board, we actually had a global reduction in energy usage, DSG emissions, water consumption, but actually an uptake as well in waste diversion rate this year. Uh, so really nothing special here, nothing nobody actually didn't expect. So I think we can also already go to the next slide. And now really coming to a different topic that we haven't talked about in, in a long time is really the net zero commitments or net zero uh, targets set by, by our member base. So what we can see here is actually the absolute number of participants in our benchmark that set net zero targets drastically increased over the last uh, three years uh, with like the highest number ever now in 2021. But what we can also see is here the proportion of uh, entities that set targets with, with a very long horizon, time horizon, meaning in this case, between 2031 and 2050 is also increasing, meaning more, most likely that entities now that finally set a net zero target uh, that, but haven't done so before, either do so to align with like the Paris Agreement to be net zero by 2050, or actually evaluate it for a longer period of time, what they can actually achieve and now set potentially more realistic targets, which might be then 2030, 2040, 2050. So really, as you can see now, like these more long-term net zero commitments by our member base. Next, next slide, please. Actually, one thing I was going to say about that one was neat, Max, was that it's if I'm reading this correctly and, and clarify, that means in 2019, you had less than 50 entities doing any type of target. But in 2021, you're having you know, what is that over 200. So it's a four times the amount of entities doing targets period, which, uh, you know, that's a substantial change. And this is no, this is only looking at the net zero targets right now. No, oh, this is only net zero targets. Okay. No, that in itself targets. is awesome. Yeah. Great. Can, uh, next slide, we actually see then how the overall target setting. Ah, uh, yeah, here we go. Great. Can now see that the percentage of entities across the benchmark that set any kind of target actually more or less kept, uh, kept the same because we still have around 25% of the entire benchmark with no targets at all. However, as we could see in the previous slide, the fraction of our ent uh, entities reporting to us actually having net zero targets increased over the years from 3.7% uh, in 2019 to now a bit more than 15% of our uh, participant entities in 2021. So here we can now see uh, the shift from setting any target to now actually setting net zero targets. Max, if, if I can interject, um, I just yeah, had a please. question. So um, I know I haven't spoken yet. Isela Rosales here from Bridge Investment Group. 
So in the target setting journey, it really is a journey. Um, and we are on the beginning of that journey. We are thinking through what targets, what numbers, what timing could make sense for a firm like ours. And just for context, we um, run about 28.7 billion in overall AUM. We have multiple asset types. And which leads me to my question, um, do you have a sense in your data yet, or maybe this is something for the future, for those that are setting targets, do they typically have one nice asset type, i.e. they 100% run commercial office, own and operate, or own and externally operate, or do they have multiple asset types? And are you seeing the same level of commitments coming through with, with these types of targets? Yeah, to answer this question, actually we can go to the next slide. Because they are actually one more slide even. We, we come back to the regional comparison later on. Because here on this slide, we actually can see the different sectors now. And we can see here that diversified portfolios with uh, multiple different property types actually have the highest um, uh, number of targets uh, set. While for example, pure office funds have actually the lowest number of, of targets um, and which is kind of surprising since normally office funds have quite high uh, control over the assets. And therefore you would maybe expect actually that office funds have more uh, targets overall, maybe even net zero targets set in the other fund, fund types. Yeah, great question. And uh, it's always great when a slide leads to the answer. So I actually have the same one. There's a question in the uh, Q&A from Hannah and she's asking about normalizing for COVID. And actually, when we get into Aaron's slides a little later uh, for measurable, where we've actually tried to isolate that out. So Aaron has tried to say, what's a baseline of, let's say, 2018, 2019, before the pandemic for energy use? And then can we see the change? And Aaron's data actually goes into this, uh, into a later part of uh, the year, too. So uh, Hannah, great question. And uh, we'll come back to that uh, in a couple of slides, I think. Uh, thanks. Absolutely. Alex, can you maybe go back one more slide now? Exactly. Because now we also have like regional slide differences. Because as we always know, like across our benchmark over the last years, was always Oceania being like the best practice, the leader of the pack, going ahead more or less, uh, leaving everybody else in the dust more or less. And with this also can be seen here now in uh, actual target setting and also setting the zero targets uh, where they actually have uh, one quarter of the Oceania uh, portfolios reporting to us actually have net zero targets already. And actually from the uh, entities that have already achieved net zero in our um, benchmark, I think oh, half, I mean, it's not, not, not many portfolios so far. I think it's only five or six portfolios right now that achieved already net zero. But I think half of these are actually coming from Australia as well, which then only showcases uh, that actually the targets also um, yield results in the end. Okay, so now correct me on my math here, I'm not, not the data science team. If you only got a hundred or so entities in Oceana and 25% of them, that means somewhere around 25 of them are doing the net zero target. So I know they are always doing awesome. But this, this today's presentation is really focused on the Americas and on the US. So if we got 10% of 366, technically did we actually have more net zero targets in the Americas set? So we don't feel so bad about it. Absolutely, and absolute, okay, numbers, and absolute numbers for sure. Okay. But I mean, in the end, like America is a quite a big country in comparison as well to Australia, right? <laughs> There's actually a question from Sarah in the chat about Australia and, and Dan and Max, I'd love to hear from you on this. Uh, she's asking why is Australia always the leader? Uh, is there regulation in price? Is it a tight network? And I think from what I saw in the past when working with Res, it's definitely kind of both those things. They have different regulations. They have a really strong green building, um, you know, uh, community and industry groups. Um, and it's a pretty tight uh, uh, industry and a, and a tight market too. So they all know what the other one's doing. Uh, Dan or Max, other perspectives on, you know, why Australia and Oceania always does pretty well? On top of that, well, I think you answered your own question. I think that was spot on. And what I observe is having robust programs like Neighbors on the energy side, as well as the, you know, the Australian Green Building, Building Council with Green Star. I mean, they're far and away the leaders when it comes to being forward thinking on green buildings. So there's just, uh, it's just a solid group of people that are really pushing the market forward. Yeah, 100%. That's also a comment by uh, Patty Mason in the 
in the uh, chat, which says Australia embraces technology. I can definitely say, uh, second this because like when we uh, talk with our Australian membership base, they're always like way ahead when it comes to technology, including technology in their buildings, systems, anything else that we see in Europe or America. So they are really on the forefront when it comes to technology and smart metering, for example, and all these like, also data collection processes by that. And also in the end, the Australian building stock is also younger than the European or American one, and therefore also often leading to being sometimes a little bit more sustainable already just by being younger. So there's also a fact that we shouldn't count out. Yeah, while we're talking net zero, um, and there's a couple of questions in the chat about defining net zero. Uh, Max, do you want to try to do that? Just how does how does GRESP, when they're setting this target, uh, setting idea on this, how do you guys define whether it's a net zero target? Is that a... Uh, right now, we actually look at more, uh, in this case, just whether uh, an entity is set in um, GSG, emissions target. Um, that would lead to zero emissions at the end date. If it's now an absolute target saying we want to decrease our emissions by 100% by X, a year X, or if it says we do a like for like uh, change of uh, X percent, which would actually accumulate to 0% overall emissions by uh, year X as well, which is then the target end year. So really in this it says it's really having zero emissions um, by the end of uh, the uh, target setting uh, horizon. We do not look here at any kind of offsets. So, the, so this is really outside, outside of this kind of analysis. We don't look at any offsets, offsetting more or less um, any energy consumption or GHG emissions in the portfolio to then become more or less net zero by offsetting your emissions. So this is really just based on, on the targets, everything that we, that we talked about here right now. And there's one other question in there that's great is uh, about scope three. Uh, associated with the building, I'm assuming that's not uh, part of that then. Um, not necessarily, exactly. I mean, this always depends on how the entity defines their uh, targets. Uh, on the research side, actually, we unfortunately don't have this granularity in our assessment at the moment. For example, on the infra side, we do ask for scope one and two or scope three emission targets. This is a granularity you don't have in, in the research assessment. Therefore, we just have overall GHG emissions, which should normally include or can include by, by definition of the indicator can include um, ten, uh, scope three and therefore the tenant emissions. And lots of great questions on here. We're going to have to watch our time today with all these great <laughs> questions. The one thing I'll also jump in and, and just say related to targets, um, and we're trying not to make this into a giant measurable sales pitch. Uh, measurable is pretty proud. We have a target setting tool. Um, in our software. So all of our customers, uh, when they're doing, you know, setting up their portfolio, they can set targets in there. Um, and we're trying to really look at how those targets could also, uh, of course, you want to make sure you got your space allocations correct. You want to make sure you've got right metering to that. So your actually targets are based on uh, quality data. And increasingly, we're trying to say, how does that relate to like a transition risk too? Um, so if you're in somewhere like New York, and you've got a local law 97 coming and you're trying to set uh, targets related to that, you want to make sure that the, the programs you're doing actually relate to trying to meet those uh, those guidelines too. So um, yeah, lots of great stuff on targets. Maybe we should uh, pause on some of these questions or we'll try to tamp, type some answers into here and we'll jump on to the next slide. Absolutely. Sound good? Yes, sounds, sounds good. Really, here, now we actually did an analysis on all the targets that we had or have in our database right now. And however, we only looked in this case at the intensity-based and like-for-like GHG targets because these kind of targets we could actually annualize. And then based on this annualization, project more or less the, uh, the targets where they would lead um, in different regions towards 2050. And then we can actually see that Australia or, or Oceania overall actually approaches this, this zero um, Missions very very soon already. So around like 2035, uh, yeah, 2035, according to the targets reported to us, Oceania would actually achieve net zero. Well, but then when we see Americas, here we can actually see that based on the targets currently reported to us, the Americas would actually not achieve net zero by 2050. Meaning most likely, the Americas or France, France America would need to set higher targets and also try to achieve the, these 
more aggressive targets. Also, though, when, when I look at the sectors, which would, would, would be on the next slide, um, is that you can see here multiple or almost all different target, uh, sectors actually approach net zero except for retail. And this is also the same trend in, in the Americas. So really the trend per sector, just really the pure funds with this is, uh, specializing on one sector, they all kind of approach net zero. And the main reason why the Americas right now are not approaching at zero are actually diversified portfolios because the diversified portfolios currently with their set targets are not approaching at zero at the moment by 2050. So the Americas, we got to pick up the pace on setting targets and uh, maybe we have to do it more in the diversified so uh, portfolios too. Um, it is a very big differential between the Oceania targets and the Americas targets on that. Um, but, and, and yeah, I think it's great feedback to, to understand the industry. We're going to set net zero targets. They have to be realistic. They have to actually go to zero at some point. So, um, yeah, this is great insight. Yeah. Next slide, please, Alex. Well, now we actually look at also like data quality, because of course, when we just, uh, when we talk about data collection, analyzing data, we also want to have good quality data and what we assessing our assessment as well is whether this data reported to us is actually third party reviewed. And what we saw now over the last year, is actually a huge change between um, entities that had the data just third party checked, which is already better than no, having no third party review at all. And now actually having more entities, um, having the data actually verified or assured. So you can actually see here that the drop in, in third party checked and the increase in verified or assured more or less neglect themselves. So you can really see the complete, complete shift from people having now a focus on data quality, data quality matters in this case. They really wanna have this third party, uh, party verification that the data points are correct and are actually of good quality when they report them to us or to the public in any kind of uh, manner. Yeah, this is interesting too. And it also plays into how uh, the scoring has gone in the last couple of years where there's obviously some changes in these questions and some increased scoring related to this. Uh, Azela or Ilya, any comments on this? Cause I know it was your first year participating in GRES this year. And uh, I can't remember exactly what happened uh, with your third party review process. Yes, great question. So we, um... We had our data verified, actually measurable, helped us in that regard, and we're very appreciative of that. And next year, we certainly want to take it up to that next level. We recognize that having it assured um, is where you want to be ultimately. Um, if for the first timers out there, if you can get there in your first year, great. Although we were perfectly happy with our choice and are making plans for next year. Yeah, great. I know in the first year, just just getting all the data together and then having some good data quality on that and consistency and getting all the meters and everything is, is hugely step one. So, um, and the same kind of thing goes for when we were looking at targets before, I'd be interested to see the correlation between, um, you know, how many of those 25% or so that like haven't set targets um, are uh, companies that are in their first year res submission, because that'd be, there's probably a high level of connection there too. So. Great, awesome, thanks, Max. Absolutely. Yeah, and then on the last slide, for my position at least, uh, now we can actually see that the original differences. And you can see that, for example, overall in Americas now, the, uh, has the largest percentage of third party review. Doesn't matter if it's now um, just reviewed, assured, or verified, but overall, third part, the com combination, the aggregation of all three different parts of third party review is actually, actually the highest in America. So apparently the Americas really uh, value this third party review of the data points. While I, like this compared for them to Asia is it's on a way lower level. And then we can see again in Australia though, is really the, the, on the forefront when it comes to having this data verified in the end. So there's really this last step of verification or assurance is really, um, well ingrained already in the Australian market or Australian mar markets that they really go this last step to go this extra mile for data quality in the end. Yeah, this is interesting. I, you know, and it's, it's huge change over the last, you know, decade of GRES. I mean, obviously I, 10 years ago, it was just getting the data 
And now it's to the point where people really want to see data quality. And I think the investors, uh, members of, of GRESB expect that too. If, if you're going to use this data for something, uh, then you want to make sure uh, the, the, the data that's being collected is accurate and timely and, and the quality. I know that's something uh, that we at Measurable has put a lot of time into in the last couple of years too, is making sure um, that the data that's getting reported into GRESB um, uh, connects to that. And when, when available, getting a verification or some kind of assurance for it too. So awesome. 100%, especially with all the upcoming new regulations now as well, really becomes more uh, important as well that we have high quality data to report not only to the industry, to the investors, but also like to the public and uh, the governance bodies overall. Great. Well, that was some that was some great stuff. Is that there? I'm not sure. Is that your last slide in there, Max? Yes. That was it from my side. So okay. Great. Well, Aaron, let's uh, let's let's do some stuff from measurable side, and hopefully there's some connection between the two. Um, so let's look at the next slide. Um, yeah. So I'm Neil Pegram. Uh, Aaron's from our data scientists uh, data science team. So he's going to be the one who really pulled this stuff together. Um, I'll start it off with just some background, a little bit on measurable and, and our relationship with Gresb, and then uh, Aaron, you can kind of dig into it. Next slide. Yeah, so just a couple of quick things. Uh, just a reminder, we are one of GRES's largest global data partners. Um, last year, we did 214 GRES uh, submissions. Um, and we're always proud that our customers have an average score increase. So we saw that again this year. 80% uh, of our customers are green stars. Um, and yeah, we've been doing this, as you can see from the chart, since 2014. Grasp uh, participation and submissions is not our only business. Uh, Measurable uh, is kind of an ESG hub, so you can collect your data right from the property and site staff down, or if you want to send it up to capital markets, we do the full meter to market stuff. Um, but of course, we also use that data to uh, have an API with uh, Gresp, and we can uh, pass that off uh, directly into there. Uh, we also help with reporting on other initiatives like CDP and other things like that too. So. Just a little background on our relationship uh, with Gresb. Uh, next slide. So Aaron, yeah, we took a lot of time here and you've done a lot of work on trying to figure out, uh, is there some correlation between COVID impacts on energy use? Um, your data is pretty much all I think on US assets. And it was great that we had a question in here earlier about can we try to isolate that out and see what some of those impacts are. So uh, I'll let you kick it off from here. Thanks, Neil. Um... So I just want to start off by quickly introducing myself. Um, I'm a data scientist with Measurable. My primary function is to work with engineering to enhance our product with data-driven features. But today I will be diving into the impacts on energy usage in the United States due to the pandemic. Um, so I'll start off by saying that in our complete database, we have data from 11 billion uh, square foot uh, real estate uh, from over 80 countries. But to, for this particular analysis, we've put together a data set of United States buildings and spaces from um, approximately six 16,000 unique spaces. So jumping right into this first slide, we want to get right at the question of how much did COVID reduce energy usage? And so in order to answer that question, we first created a 12 month baseline period that occurred two years prior to the pandemic. Then. Moving to the second bar in the chart, we can see that in the year prior to COVID, we were already seeing a modest decrease in energy usage intensity in the United States. However, this was approximately about one to 2%. Then in, during the first year of the pandemic, we see energy usage intensity tank or decrease very significantly. And if we compare this decrease to the year before, we see this decrease is actually 10X compared to what the prior year was showing. And then the final interesting piece of this slide is that we see in year two of COVID, we continue to see EUI decrease. And ultimately we are now down about 16% in terms of energy usage intensity compared to our baseline period. Yeah, I thought this was really interesting that, you know, people think things are coming back on some level and, and they are, but also, and I, I would have thought it was pretty similar last year to this year, but actually, up to current, which is actually still going down uh, this year was a significant, which is really interesting. And this is for all asset types across the US, right? So it's a pretty general one. Yes, 100%, Neil. This is an aggregate of all of our spaces across all our asset types. And 
obviously the next interesting question is to sort of break down this effect across our different asset types. And so let's move on to the next slide to look at that. So this is essentially the exact same plot as the year before, but here we're first plotting the sort of effects uh, specifically for residential spaces. So the line represents the median USA residential space um, across each of the periods that we outlined in the last slide. And we can see that for the median residential space, it did see a decrease during the pandemic, although this decrease was pretty modest um, relative to what we were seeing at the aggregate level across all asset types. And we can also see that this decrease was primarily driven during the first year of COVID. And so ultimately, retail is down about nine to 10% compared to baseline levels. And this trend that we see in retail spaces holds true, um, next slide please, for healthcare asset spaces, as well as next slide, warehouse spaces. Yeah, Aaron, I think we might have now, did you, I think you might have said retail, but what you meant was residential, right? So yeah, that's all good. Um, this is interesting because yeah, those are those are unique assets that have been affected quite differently during this pandemic. Of course, warehouses in theory have had a lot more usage, um, and so it's interesting that it's going down. Um, and healthcare, we all think that that should be uh, going uh, up. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. Isella or Ilya, any thoughts on this? Because we know you have a lot of multi-res spaces too. Um, what about on the ground? Any thoughts for how you've seen impacts of COVID on energy use? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to just highlight the healthcare one because I think that's always most of it, most interesting, maybe not necessarily intuitive to everybody. And we are owners and operators of seniors housing, which I believe is what comprises most of that healthcare figure, as at least from your analysis. And what we found is we were generally uh, pretty even on occupancy, where we sometimes would face impacts to the occupancy is any local regulations. In other words, we were, were doing everything we're supposed to be doing to keeping the residents safe and allowing for new residents to enter our communities. However, if the, if the regulations said, you are not allowed to have your doors open at this particular time, and believe it or not, that changed. It could change week to week, not just month to month. So we had to also um, absorb the shock of that. So I'd be interested to know too, and I don't know if it's even possible to dissect the data that way, but where did we see any, any usage changes during those periods when things, when cases got really high in certain parts of our country? And again, I'm speaking just from the US, that's all that Bridge does is invest across the US. But um, it is interesting to see, you know, I'm sure there was similar events taking place in Europe and Oceania and everywhere else in the world. Yeah. Yeah, great question. And there's an infinite amount of data to dig into this. And, and we'd love to get to that more. And I think we'll, we'll look at that a bit more after, uh, after this too. Awesome. Aaron, what about some other uh, space types on here? Definitely. Yeah, thanks for that color, Gisela. The, uh, for the definitely for our healthcare asset types, we have a large amount of senior home care um, facilities. So that definitely does align with what you're talking point. But sort of moving on to this sort of asset types that contrast with these three. Um, so let's look at the next slide. We can see office uh, spaces were drastically more affected than the previous three asset types. And we can see ultimately that office spaces are down about 25%, more than double the pr previous three um, asset space, space types um, during, due to the pandemic. Um, and this trend that we see in office spaces is mirrored by, next slide, that in which we see in retail spaces. Um, a third, a sort of a final asset type that sort of bucks both these two trends, um, next slide, would be for hotels, which lines with what we saw earlier from Max and Grez in that it took a massive dive, the biggest dive out of all asset classes during the first year of COVID dropping to 25% below baseline levels. But we can actually see that in year two of the pandemic, it is sort of rebounding at a pretty, pretty rapid pace. So moving forward, we wanted to drill down one level further and, in, and not just look at 
the slice and dice the data based off of asset class, but really drill down into specific building use types and really try and get at the question of what specific building use types were most affected by the pandemic. And so next slide, please. So here on the Y axis, you see the specific building use types in which we had sufficient data uh, for this analysis to produce these metrics for. And then in the chart in the green bar, you see the percent change from pre-COVID levels uh, for year one of the pandemic. And in the black line, you see the same percent change from pre-COVID levels based on year two of the pandemic. And so it's no surprise the sort of type building types you see in the top left of this chart. Um, but it's nice to sort of validate that intuition and be able to sort of rank them and really say the top three building types that were most impacted by COVID in order are movie theaters at number one, restaurant and bars at number two, and fitness centers at number three. Another interesting takeaway from this plot is that in the United States, uh, movie theaters, for the most part, um, essentially closed or were at very limited occupancy during the first year of the pandemic. And so one might intuit that we would should see their EUI decrease, you know, 80, 90 percent. But we see that they're in this chart, based on our data, that their EOI is decreasing about 45 percent. And this is kind of in line with what we've been hearing in that um, a lot of spaces when they went down to very limited or no occupancy, actually were not able to drop their EUI usage below a sort of baseline level. And that was due to um, maintenance upkeep or just contractual agreements between the building operators and the tenants, whereby the building operators were supposed to keep the space running at a certain level of um, certain level. And if not, the sort of would give the permission to the tenant to break the lease agreement. Yeah, I think this is this is interesting stuff. And you know, actually there was a good question in the, the chat that Dan answered. Um, I think a lot of us thought, well, when the office buildings close and everybody's working from home, then energy use is going to go down like 80%. You know, the thing is going to basically go, go cold. Uh, but it, that's not actually what we saw. Uh, and it's really interesting because for the last you know decade or whatever, everybody's been talking about energy efficiency and like how much uh, can you get out of a, let's say, an office building. What is the base load of that building? Um, and we sure kind of tested that. And I think a lot of uh, property management companies discovered that actually, even when the place is completely emptied, uh, they and they still have to keep some power and lights running, um, and that load is still pretty high. And that was a really interesting thing to see. Uh, although clearly, shutting your movie theater down, uh, you know, is, is also not ninety percent uh, zero. You know, that kind of way to zero, but uh, is a much bigger impact for sure. Oh. 100%. Um, and then I see a quick question in the chat from Trish, thoughts on multifamily in terms of going down in usage and why. And this could be because of simple vacancy of, of units um, would be my hunch. Although, again, as Max alluded to earlier, it's hard to really come to causal conclusions based off of these metrics, types of metrics. Um, so the next slide is we want to move away from um, looking at the pandemic's effect on different types and classes and start moving to geography. And the first and the question we want to ask is what specific cities were most impacted by COVID in the United States? And here it's no surprise that New York was the city most impacted, um, being the initial epicenter of the outbreak in America. Um, but one sort of in, in illuminative part takeaway from this slide is we can compare New York to another major city like San Francisco, and we can see that the EUI decreased New York experience was almost double that of a city like San Francisco. And, and so that should sort of maybe give us a little bit of an intuition, at least emotionally, of how much New York City was truly affected by this pandemic. Aaron, if I could just, just jump in here. So I, I'm in the Bay Area currently, but I spent about a decade in New York. So this this slide really resonates with me. And um, I happened to live at that time. I, I was in New York. I worked in New York. But if you just think about the sheer number of individuals, and I think it's somewhere around 1 million people commute into New York City to work. So, and it, it sounds, I think it's up somewhere up there about 20, that represents about 20% of the workforce. So 
that makes a lot of sense when you put it into that context, because the majority of those people, they stayed home. So whether they're in New Jersey, they're in upstate New York, some people commute as far as Philly and DC, um, that, that was not happening during the pandemic. Wow, yes. And I think that sort of anecdote really relates well to our next slide, because I, in our next slide, we're gonna try and see if we start looking at EUI month over month during the course of the pandemic, whether this really tells the story of what was happening maybe on the ground in New York City with people commuting to the city to work and what happened to the residences, re residents that were living in, in the city itself. And so here, what we see on the um, x-axis is months ranging from January 2019 to December 2020. And on the y-axis, we have the year over year percent change versus our baseline year of 2018. And in black, the line represents the median office space in New York City, and the green line represents the median residential space in New York City. And you can see that prior to the pandemic, these lines were tracking each other very closely and that both of them were slightly going down in terms of their EUI consumption. And we can see that right at March, 2020, where New York City declared a state of emergency, all of a sudden things drastically changed and these two lines start diverging considerably, whereby office space starts tanking as people stop coming into work, stop commuting to the city. And the green line skyrockets as residents start sheltering in place. And this divergent trend continues to happen until June, 2020, the month where New York City decides to start their reopening with phase one. And at that point, you can see that both these lines start tracking closer together into sort of the new normal where we find ourselves now. And so one sort of overall takeaway from this slide is that analyzing and being able to track your energy usage data can be really impactful and important in that it really can reflect real world events and trends that are, that are happening. Yeah, I mean, this is great. First off, just great work by you and, and our data science team for trying to like dig into this a little bit more and try to, uh, you know, line this up with actually uh, the regulation changes in, in New York and stuff. I think it's really fascinating to see. It's, I don't think it's all that surprising. This is kind of what most of us thought, but it's great to start to see the data kind of like align with this too. There is a bunch of questions in some of the chats, you know, trying to get a little more details on this. This is the best we have for today is I think we went down to this level of detail, which is which is pretty great. Um, yeah, any comments from anybody else on, on here regarding this or from, from the GRESP side too, thoughts on, on, on these results? Neil, I've been trying to keep up in the chat. There's been a yeah. lot of great yeah, questions. Dan, you're answering questions like a machine in the chat box there. So I know you spent a lot of time <laughs> in New York too. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll jump forward then. Um, awesome. Yeah, so let's uh, end on the final analysis slide. And we want to sort of end with this, this question that is maybe a little bit deeper, whereby we want to sort of get at uh, whether energy usage fluctuations have stabilized to pre-COVID levels in this new normal. And in order to answer that question, we went back into our data set four years prior to the pandemic. And we started plotting year over year percent changes. And we can see that prior to the pandemic, like year over year percent changes really stayed between about negative two, positive 2%. And then we can see that during the first year of the pandemic, the year over year changes blew that sort of range out of the water, dropping about 9%. But interestingly, in the second year of the pandemic, we see that you know, UI uses are continuing to decrease the rate of decrease is back into this 2% year over year range. And so what this analysis is maybe indicating is that obviously uh, the COVID has sort of dropped UI usage down to new historic baseline levels, but perhaps the trends that were influencing the fluctuations of UI prior to the pandemic haven't really been fundamentally changed. And that's what we should sort of expect going forward in this new lower EUI usage baseline reality. 
so I guess got a question of where these data weather normalized. And so the answer it directly is no, but the uh, follow up is that since we are comparing always year to year across the same spaces, um, hopefully it shouldn't have too much of an impact in terms of like the overall message that these plots are trying to show. Yeah. In the so next, time, we only got five more minutes here, Aaron. So uh, and I guess what I will say mm -hmm. overall, there's it, this brought up tons of questions for us too. And you could just keep going deeper and deeper into this and, you know, slice it by kilowatt hours or intensities or by individual cities and stuff. What are some big conclusions on here? Yeah, perfect deal. And so let's end with our next slide. And so we just wanted to give you a few key takeaway bullet points to sort of have in your back pocket based off this presentation. And so the first one is that we saw an EUI decrease of 10X during the first year of COVID, um, 10X compared to that downward trend that we were already seeing pre-COVID. The second bullet point is that for spaces in residential healthcare and warehouse assets, we see that they're ultimately down about 10% do uh, over the course of the pandemic. And this contrasts with spaces in retail and office that are down 25%, more than double. And then finally, based off the analysis that I showed you on the last slide, um, one takeaway might be that though COVID has led to an overall decrease in EUI, going forward, we expect to see UI trends similar to those seen pre-COVID. Uh, pre um, and yeah, that's awesome. Um, well, thank you so much, Aaron. I think there's some really great food for thought there for sure. Um, and we only have a few more minutes left. I wanted to bring Bridge back into the discussion and just kind of talk a little bit at a bigger picture about uh, Gred's participation and data quality and stuff. Uh, maybe Ilya, I know your job was really to kind of pull all this ESG data together for your first year submission. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, how that went, uh, about how you guys looked at data quality and making sure your sites were all lined up and what were some features that uh, you used to do that? Yeah, so as Sela mentioned before, this year was our uh, first uh, time responding to the GRASP assessment. And what we, we are a very uh, driven uh, data-driven organization and we value uh, data integrity uh, so so first it was really it was really helpful to have that additional layer of uh, data quality verification uh, that measurable is served uh, as uh, but then we also it was really helpful the you know the qualitative engagement that we had with measurable to in order to understand what are some of the gaps uh, that we have across our assets and one of the features that they, they use was data completeness that they share with us throughout the Gresby submission in the process uh, we met on a weekly basis and sometimes even more in order to, to be able to understand what's going on in our assets. And instead of just going, you know, trying to uh, go through all of our assets and understand what's going on, we would get these kind of like um, targeted uh, uh, data points, uh, which really helped us uh, throughout the process. And I think for our first time responding, it can be a little bit overwhelming to, you know, to face a new assessment and then identify different gaps in the data and try to, to do it all at once. Uh, so having a partner like Measurable, uh, uh, which you know, organization that worked with Gress for, for years now, um, is really helpful. Yeah, great. Well, we're glad to hear that's how it went for you. That's, that's the design of the whole system is the, to be able to make sure that when you're bringing all this stuff in for the first time, uh, you know, allocations, uh, quality, uh, and also I think you guys use our utility sync uh, tool too, so you can actually tie your actual utility meter data in. Uh, it also, I know there was a comment about um, uh, energy, um, energy uh, portfolio manager and energy star too, and we have a two way with that system too, so I know that helps with uh, that data too. Azella, any uh, last thoughts on this before we try to wrap this project up? I think you're on mute for the last second here. That's all good. Sure. Um, I would say if I could go back in time, give myself yeah. or give our team some, some first timer tips. And I don't know for those on the call, how many are in this camp? 70% um, of your score with Grez comes down to data management. And I cannot emphasize that enough. I think even though we heard it, we heard it directly from Dan, we heard it from you know written sources. It didn't sink home until we started using Measurable and we realized just how valuable the tool was. To your point on Energy Star Portfolio Manager, 
uh, we, we looked at our data and ESPM on a daily basis. And so for those that haven't started on that journey, definitely start yourself on Energy Star Portfolio Manager. Now, if you don't have the resources or the time to do that, that's in fact where the utility sync feature measurable definitely can be your, your life uh, changer there. And over time, you may not need utility sync, but if that's what gets you going, like what gets things started, absolutely. Because for us, I was looking at our numbers, we've got about 54 million square feet running through measurable systems. It's about 250 plus individual sites. And of those, about 20% use utility sync. So wow. it's, it's, a, it's awesome. a notable portion. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big portfolio. Um, well, I know we're at time. I want to uh, thank Dan and Max and the whole Grez team for your data dive stuff and all your work there. Thank Aaron for uh, that interesting, all this work you did. I know it took months to pull all that together. Um, Dan, last final words before we shut this project down? No, I think this has been tremendous. And you know, the data is the most difficult part. So we met the industry where it was a decade ago. Together, we've all helped us progress forward. Performance and net zero is where everybody's heading. So everybody keep up the good work because that's where we got to go. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day. Bye, everybody.